Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to put together everything we've talked about in this unit to figure out whether a molecule itself is polar or nonpolar. And that's going to take looking at not only the types of bonds in the molecule, but how those molecule, uh, how those bonds are arranged in a 3D structure. And so a polar molecule is any molecule that has what's called a permanent dipole, which means a permanent distribution of charge. Now again, these are still neutral molecules. They aren't ions, they aren't polyatomics. Obviously those things would have a charge. But what we get is kind of an ionic character of the bonds, meaning we have an unequal distribution of charge. And then it's a being really important. Sort of consider it like you have a boat full of boys and girls, and, and you have equal numbers of boys and girls. It's an equal gender distribution. But all the boys go to one side of the boat, and all the girls go to another side of the boat. Um, that, that could create different interactions with other boats that go by. And that's sort of what we have here. What either due to the fact that you have electronegative uh, bond differences or the fact that your formal charge is imbalanced. And we'll show you how those two situations work out. So nonpolar molecules, by default, are, is anything with a charge symmetry. And, and again, you'll get pretty good at just eyeballing this kind of stuff. But if you, if, if you have you know, a, a geometry that supports an equal distribution of charge all over the place, then you're going to be nonpolar, and that's going to have different interactions with other molecules. Now, you've probably realized that uh, the term polar and nonpolar are used a lot, and unfortunately it's used in two very similar situations. And so we can talk about polar or nonpolar covalent bonds, and that's only talking about a specific bond, whether or not the electrons in that specific bond are shared equally or unequally. And polar and nonpolar bonds, along with geometry, can lead to entire molecules being also considered polar or nonpolar. And again, that's just a really unfortunate uh, misuse of, well, not misuse, but uh, redundant terminology in chemistry. And that happens every now and then. So be careful if you're talking about the polarity of a molecule or the polarity of a bond, because they are different. You can have nonpolar molecules that have polar covalent bonds, and you could have polar molecules that have nothing but nonpolar bonds inside of them. So that's a little crazy, but that's the, that's the world we live in. So why should you care about polarity? As, as we said before, polar molecules have an unequal distribution of charge. They don't have an overall charge, they're overall neutral. But what this means is they tend to have more ionic character, some people may say, which means that they have increased interactions with anything that has a partial charge or a full charge. And so what I did is I drew, have some water molecules here, and, and they're interacting with each other because they're all polar, and they're interacting with ions. And you could be, probably guess what side of the water molecules have a partially negative charge on which sides have a partially positive charge. And so that's going to lead to some really important intermolecular forces that we're going to get to next time. And so you're probably a polar molecule if you have one of these two situations, and that's unshared pairs on the central atom or different terminal atoms coming off the central atom. That's, and, and, and if you see either one of those, you're probably going to be polar. Now I am going to put a little disclaimer in here for the people who have done uh, five or six clouds. Now theoretically you could have um, multiple unshared pairs in five or six clouds creating charge symmetry, uh, but we're going to skip that for now because we've only gone up to two, three, or four clouds. Um, again, it's not a big leap for those of you on to five or six clouds, but just to, just to put a little disclaimer out there. So if you do only have two, three, or four clouds and you have unshared pairs in those clouds on the central atom, you're going to end up with an asymmetric distribution of charge no matter what. Even if you have polar bonds, polar covalent bonds, like for instance in ammonia, um, this has an electronegativity difference of almost one, um, you're going to get a, uh, a bond dipole vector uh, that don't cancel out. So look at those three uh, bond dipole vectors. Um, you, you've got the positive hydrogen uh, driving electrons towards the negative nitrogen, and those don't cancel out. If we had another hydrogen coming off the top, they would cancel out, but, but since we don't, they can't. And so if those were three little motors, that little molecule would go somewhere, and that's really the basic idea. Do the vectors cancel out? And so what happens is this creates an overall molecular dipole. All right, so we have partially negative and partially positive charges there, and that's a lowercase delta there, so you'll see that a lot. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. But even if you had nonpolar covalent bonds, uh, you're not safe. And so one of, the, one of the classic tricky ones about this is ozone. Ozone is actually a polar molecule, despite the fact that it has no 
polar covalent bonds. And that's because uh, you've got an unequal distribution of electrons anyway. And this is where formal charge comes into play. Uh, if you figure out the formal charge of each one of those oxygens, you'll figure out that the oxygen in the middle actually has a plus one formal charge because it wants six valence electrons, but it only has five. And then the oxygen on the end has uh, a formal charge of minus one because it has seven electrons around it, but it started with six. And so we can still have uh, dipole moments in molecules even if there are no polar covalent bonds. So again, that's the problem with polarity is there's no absolute way of always knowing. <laughs> you usually have to, you know, turn over a couple stones and make sure there's nothing hiding from you. Anyway, if you have different terminal atoms, um, you're going to have a polar molecule. And here's why. Because it's going to lead to different uh, bond types and that's going to lead to different uh, dipole vectors. For the instance of uh, chloromethane, uh, you're going to have a you're going to have slightly different polarity of those bonds, and that's going to lead to an overall molecular dipole. And so again, if we were to show where the the dipoles go for each one of those bonds, um, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, but chlorine is more electronegative than carbon, and so that's going to lead to an overall dipole pointing towards chlorine. It's not going to be much, but it's going to be enough to give this a some some polar characteristics. And so the chlorine is going to be partially negative and the rest of the molecule will be partially positive. And this can also happen in uh, what are called heteronuclear diatomics. That means, uh, obviously, uh, two atoms of different types. And that should make sense, too, that if you have two different atoms, you're probably going to have an electronegativity difference. And hence, um, you know, one side is going to be partially positive and one side is going to be partially negative. And so that's, for instance, of carbon monoxide uh, is considered a polar molecule. All right? So there's not much left after that. So you're probably, anything else is really a symmetrical arrangement of similar bonds is the simplest way I can put it. You know, it, any of that's going to lead to what's not, what's considered a nonpolar uh, molecule. So for instance, um, let's take carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide are, is polar covalent bonds uh, but due to the uh, symmetry, due to the symmetrical arrangement of those electron clouds, they actually cancel each other out. And so you can have polar covalent bonds leading to a nonpolar molecule if the symmetry balances each other out. Again, if those were little motors, they would be canceling each other out. And that's how you end up with a nonpolar molecule. Now, again, if you have uh, symmetry of bonds and nonpolar covalent, then you're, you're totally set. Uh, but we don't really don't like to worry about it if you have polar covalent bonds and make sure that they cancel each other out. And, I, I mean, I guess I should throw in, too, the idea of homonuclear diatomics. Again, elemental diatomics. Um, obviously, if you have two atoms of the same element bound together, they're going to have uh, charge symmetry. Um, you're going to have equal electronegativity val values, so you're going to have a zero electronegativity difference. So, I mean, obviously, I should probably throw that in there, too. So I guess if you're looking for a summary, you know, uh, a hard, fast rule, if you have a symmetric arrangement of similar bonds, which sounds like a mouthful, but that's about as simple as I can get it, you're probably a nonpolar molecule, all right? Meaning that you're, you're uh, y even if you have um, bond polarity, uh, they're going to cancel each other out. So you're going to have a polar molecule. I mean a nonpolar molecule. Otherwise, uh, you know, whether you have unshared pairs on a central molecule or an unequal arrangement, then you're going to be polar. So I hope that helps. Um, you know, so the idea of recognizing things as polar or nonpolar is super important. And so that's going to lead to intermolecular forces, which we're going to go over next time. So thanks for watching and have a great day.